This sermon was preached at Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope you enjoy. How would you respond if you got this text from an unknown number? Hey, Amanda, it's, offer, offer, it's Officer Fullerton with the Portland Police. I found your ID. Can you please call me back? Now, what you need to know is that Amanda had lost her wallet. It had been stolen uh, a few days earlier, and she got this text on her cell phone out of the blue. What would you think? Would you think it's a legitimate thing? Would you think it was a scam? Somebody trying to take you even more? Well, Amanda didn't think it was really all that serious, and so she said some not-so-choice words. And then there's no way a cop has my cell phone number. Nice try, you creep. To which Officer Fullerton responded with this image. (laughs) He didn't give up. He saw her doubt. He understood why her doubt was there. And he sent her this photo. Hey, I'm legit. Here I am. Here's your ID. Here's my police car. To which Amanda had her doubts removed and she said, okay, I'll talk to you after work. But I want you to think about what would you be like in that moment? That moment of doubt of what's true and what's not. And what it feels like to kind of struggle in that and the tension of there. Well, I begin my sermon this morning because that's exactly the kind of moment we're going to find ourselves in our text. Here at Crossway, we preach to a book, and we are preaching through the Gospel of Luke. We find ourselves at Luke 18 through 35, and what we're going to wrestle with and see is that John the Baptist, a man who's pretty well known and plays a pretty prominent role in Scripture, actually has some doubts. And he's going to communicate those, some questions for Jesus And I think this is a good passage for us because a lot of us struggle with doubts. It's part of our life. We have these questions as we go through life and and things we need to process. And so today we see how we can deal with those doubts and how God responds to them. So if you want to turn with me in your Bibles, uh, Luke 7, verse 18 through 35, as I said, is where we're at. You can use the Pew Bibles in front of you if you prefer your phone, tablet. We use the YouVersion app. You can pull that up and it has... Um, the text. There's also sermon notes in the back in the bulletin um, if you didn't get those as well. Uh, But this is the word of the Lord. John's disciples told him about all these things, calling to, and all these things are the healings that we had just seen, specifically the healing of the centurion's servant and also the healing of the widow's son or raising of the dead of the widow's son. And calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sickness, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now after John's messengers had left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in the palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among these born of women, there is no one greater than John, Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in a marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, 
And you say, here's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. Now, in order to really grasp the, the kind of greatness of the story, or at least understand where John the Baptist, we have to go back and go look at John the Baptist a little bit. For those of you who are unfamiliar with, in the Bible, John the Baptist plays a pretty big role. And it's not surprising that he, or it might actually be a little surprising, that we see that he has some doubts here um, after some of the certainty that we saw. John the Baptist was, is in Luke's scripture passage from the very beginning. His dad was Zechariah and his mother was Elizabeth. And God foretold that he was going to play this special role, that he would be the messenger as the passage in of Isaiah that Jesus quoted here highlighted. He, when he grew up, he didn't wear fine linen and he didn't wear uh, uh, anything fancy. He was known for wearing ca uh, camel skin and eating locusts and honey. So when Jesus asks these kind of rhetorical questions about fine clothes and all this, he's really saying, hey, look, you didn't come because John was this great guy or going to give you all kinds of power and luxury or any of that. No, you came because the words he spoke had power. And they had power. We see that in our text where many people repented of their sins because that's what God, or John, God used John the Baptist to do. He used him to tell them that the Messiah was going to come, and they needed to be careful. They needed to prepare and repent of their sins, and many did. He had a huge following. Now, in Jesus' baptism, which we saw in Luke, there's a major event. And we see in other places that John actually declared that Jesus was the Messiah, and we know that he heard God's voice speak when he baptized Jesus. A dove descended, and the voice of God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. In John, the gospel, it says, he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And at the end, he says, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. So John has known from the very beginning that he has been set aside by God. I mean, it was a miracle that an old couple who was beyond uh, childbearing years could have a baby and the whole story of an angel appearing to Zechariah was communicated to him. He was there at Jesus' baptism and knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And even, I'm sure his mom told him that he knew very from the very beginning when he left in her, in her womb, when Jesus and Mary came. So John, for the ages, was this guy who had known firmly what God had called him to do and what his role was. But something happened. You see, Luke tells us, he combines the story a little bit earlier. Matthew does it right before the text that we look at in his version here, that John had spoken boldly against the king. Now, calling out the king's sin is not the way to win and influence people, right? It's not going to put you on their good side, especially when you call out the fact that he actually was, uh, took his brother's wife, and they weren't happy. And we'll see their anger kind of continues as we see. But Herod put him in prison. Now, many think that this prison was probably in Herod's uh, castle, one of his palaces. And John sat there. We don't know for how long, but it was a dark place, a grungy place. I want you to think about, too, how he knew he was called to preach repentance and Herod didn't repent. And now, every time he heard the noise of Herod's great parties and that, it was this kind of thing of, well, am I sensing what God is telling me is true or is it not? He was in a dark place wondering, what is it that God is doing in all of this? And there was questions that were arising. Now, again, we may look at John and say, man, if anybody shouldn't have questions, it's you. I mean, look at your life, how you, it was clear from all these miraculous things that God had a plan and he, you were a great part of it. But yet, doubt and question sunk in. And so there's a reason why that is. It's because John expected the Messiah to bring God's judgment. You see, in, God's, or in John's vision of God's plan, 
Jesus was going to come and be that Messiah, and he would do all the healings that he had been doing to prove that he was the Messiah. But then he would also bring God's judgment. He would bring it on the Romans. He would bring it on Herod. He would bring it on all those who didn't bother to repent. And so he saw the healings, but he didn't see the judgment. And he's in this dark place, physically, spiritually, wondering, where is God in all of this? So John, who is obviously in communication with his disciples, brings those questions to Jesus. Luke tells us that he asked two disciples to go and ask this very specific question. Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Think about the bold statements he had made. He is greater than I. I don't even, de- I don't even deserve to be the sandals under his feet. He is the Lamb of God who came to save the world. He is the Messiah. And now he asks this question, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? How things have changed. And Luke doesn't actually like pull the punch from the question at all. I mean, it would have been fine for him just to bring the question and for him to tell the disciples, go and raise this you know, question to Jesus. And he could have just said, uh, they asked Jesus and this is what Jesus said. But he wants that question to hang in the text. So he repeats it. He wants us to see that even powerful men of God sometimes have doubts and questions. They, they have these things where their understanding of God is clouded more than they would care to admit. And Luke crafts the story in a way that the question is repeated twice to bring emphasis to it, that we see it and let it hang in the air, the emotions of it behind it. I wanted to think about your own life. Because whether we care to admit it, sometimes in churches we can admit it because, man, you have to put on that happy face and you have to pretend like everything's fine. You can't admit your doubts. You can't admit your questions. But the reality is, is that we, like John, sometimes face these difficult circumstances that cause us to question. What are those dark places that have caused you to doubt? Or maybe are causing you to doubt right now? Oftentimes, I find that they're tough life situations. They could be a sickness that we have or our loved ones have. We could see our, our family suffer or people close to us suffer. Maybe it's even seeing people that we respect have moral failures and make us wonder, is the gospel that they preach true? It could be just tough life circumstances, the loss of a job or a relational breakdown. It can sometimes even be intellectual curiosities, you know? I mean, when we start to learn the gospel, it's the basics, but as we kind of grow in our knowledge of Jesus, there's more and more questions that come as we read the Bible. And it's like, huh, I never thought about this before. No matter what stage we're in, many of us have these kind of questions and these doubts and I think the story of John the Baptist here gives us a great roadmap of what we can do with those doubts. First thing is to admit we have them. And so I want you to ask that question. What questions or doubts are stirring inside of you? But the next question is, are we going to follow what John does, which is, are we going to bring them to Jesus? We'll talk about ways that we can bring them to Jesus in a minute, but I want you to think about those three questions. What situations are causing you to ask questions? What are the questions you're asking? And what are you doing with them? Are you trying to stuff them under the rug? Or are you exposing them to the light and bringing them to Jesus? Now, Jesus' response to John is really important for us to see here. I want you to think about all the things Jesus could have been to John. He could have gone to John, John, man, you know your story. You know everything that God did to 
give you to Zechariah to Elizabeth. You heard the story of you jumping in my wound and knowing there is something different in my wound, in Mary's wound, uh, in your mother's wound, when Mary walked in with me in her womb. You, you know that you were called and set apart. You saw how God used you, even though you were not what they expected, to draw people to faith. And you were there in the baptism when you heard God's voice. <laughs> Man, what are you doing? But we don't sense that kind of shortness or frankness or impatient with John. Rather, what we see is that there, he's patient with them. Now, Luke makes it clear that he's continually doing healing, and he, he did healing right in front of the eyes of the disciples when they asked that question so that they could be first-hand reporters back to John. Not just hearsay, but they were first-rate witnesses. But he doesn't say, tell him to get over it. No. Instead, he's patient with him, and he answers their question. And he sends them a two-part answer. The first part is all of this stuff about go back and report to him that, that they have, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Now, I could show you about five or six different passages in Isaiah where all of these point to this being who the Christ is. I'm just going to put two up here right now. Isaiah 29, verse 18, it says, In that day the deaf will hear the words of the scroll. Out of the gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. And once more the humble will rejoice in the Lord, and the needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. And Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6 then they, the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. And if you look at it in verses four and, uh, 3 and 4 of Isaiah 35, if you want to turn to your Bibles there, it talks about how the Messiah is going to come and bring salvation and vengeance. So what he's acknowledging is, John, I know the prophecies that you are asking about. And I want you to know that I am that Messiah that Isaiah prophesied. I am the one. But he also gives us this curious line at the end that says, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now what are we to make of that? Well, one, Isaiah uses very similar language in Isaiah 8 verse 14 where he says, he will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And so what he's highlighting and reminding John is that the actions of the Messiah will not be all well received. Some will believe in him and some will not. And so he's encouraging John, don't stumble because I don't match your expectation. Jesus just said, I'm the, Isaiah's Messiah. I am the one. You don't need to look any further, so don't stumble. But don't stumble because I don't quite line up with these nice, neat way that you expect me to work. Not only though does Jesus give that challenge, I want you to see not only is he patient, but he then turns his attention and goes back to affirm John's importance in the role in God's plan. I mean, think about this. Jesus could have said, you know, okay, John, God called you to your task. You brought the way. You're in prison. You're going to end up losing your life. And so, you know, God did your role and move on. But instead, he turns to the people and affirms this man who asks these questions right now is still the great messenger of God and a great prophet. And so even in the midst of his questions, even in the midst of his asking for more information, John affirms, or Jesus affirms John. He doesn't diminish him. He affirms him. Now, this last line Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he is one that makes every, all kinds of scholars wonder. 
I mean, what does Jesus mean by that? He just affirms that, Je- that John is, there's no one greater in, in all of earth, and that he's more than a prophet. So what's this last line mean? Well, some believe that it foreshadows John's death, that he's not going to get to see the end of the story, and that uh, those who get to see the end and know the end are somewhat kind of greater because they'll get to see that. I purposely b- personally believe that Jesus uses that as this kind of statement to transition to the warning for those who are around him because he does that in the text. And we see that he not only speaks to John, he answers his question, but then he speaks to the people as well. And he kind of highlights that same message that he's been giving to John. The first thing he says is, listen, what's important is that you acknowledge that God's ways are right. Now Luke does this in a little bit of a parenthetical way. You'll see that the NIV, and I think even the ESV does as well, puts this in parentheses. But obviously Luke is getting this from from the Lord somehow, from the power of the Holy Spirit, obviously, where it says that all the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they'd been baptized by John. I want you to see here what's happening is when they were baptized by John, they didn't know the full picture. John just called them to repentance that the Messiah was coming and they needed to prepare their hearts. And so in that moment, they grasped what they needed to grasp, even though they didn't have the big picture. And what he's saying is that you may not always understand God's ways, but you can still acknowledge that they're right. And think about this. It's not just John or or, or Jesus who teaches this in the story. It's throughout Scripture. I mean, look at the book of Job. The book of Job is literally Job asking questions of God when difficult things happen, when he loses his farm, when he loses his family, and he has bad advice from his friends. But he still asks the questions. He does what John does. He he brings them to the Lord. And at the end of it, Job replies to the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is that obscures my plans without knowledge? And he says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. And so part of the discipleship process is recognizing that we don't know everything. We know what we need to know to have faith in Christ and to put our hope and trust in him. And and as we grow in faith, And as we understand scriptures, more and more things will begin to make more sense. But we still may have questions. Things may pop up in our minds. But when we face those moments of doubt, those moments of questioning, the first thing we should do is say, Lord, I don't understand, but I want to submit to you and acknowledge that your ways are right. We also see here that moving beyond doubt often requires giving up our expectations about God and how he works. And we see this because he, Jesus highlights this little kind of parable thing about we played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang for a dirge and you did not cry. It's games that the children would play where they would play weddings and the people didn't respond the way that they wanted them to, or play funerals, and they didn't respond the way that they wanted them to. And what he's saying is that the teachers of the law, especially, that's who Luke highlights here, but those who who don't acknowledge and submit to the ways of the Lord, we have these expectations of God. And oftentimes the doubts that we face, the questions that we have, are these times where it's like, God, I thought life was this, and now it's this, and it's not quite lining up. Now what do I do in all of this? And And really what that is, is us saying to God, I'm smarter than you, and I know the way life needs to be, so get in line. I mean, that's really what this is, right? I mean, the parable is, we played the pipe for you, and you didn't dance. You're supposed to dance. And then we pretended to be in a funeral, and we we played the dire mood, and you didn't do that. And then he goes on to say, to, and call out the, the religious leaders to say, when John the Baptist came, neither eating bread or wine, you say he has a demon. In other words, 
John preached repentance. He told you to prepare and to submit. And you just dismissed him and said, he was satanic. And then the Son of Man comes, and he eats and drinks, the opposite of what John does. And what do you say? Well, he eats and drinks too much with the bad people. The gluttons and the drunkards and the friends of the tax collectors, because we can't listen to him either. And the point is, is that here is God acting, being clear, speaking to them through John and through Jesus. But because they have this idea and they think they know what's best, they're missing it. And so when we face those doubts, when we face those questions, the first thing we do is we bring them to Jesus honestly. We submit to him and say, your ways are right. Even when I don't understand, I'm going to trust that you can work even in all of this. But we also have to do the hard work of looking at our own expectations. Because oftentimes when we come to God, we're more directed by things subconsciously or even consciously than we sometimes realize. There are things that we think that God should react in a certain way that actually aren't based on Scripture at all, but rather how we feel or what we think or what culture tells us. And we have to wrestle with those expectations. I've used this analogy in the, for a while, so for some of you who've been here at Crossway, uh, you know, I'm sorry, this is just, it's, it's pivotal, but the first summer after Crossway started worship services, we lost half our families. We didn't have a fight, it was just right in the bad time of the economy and people moved away. Um, and I remember having to sit down with the um, two people who were in charge of, tr- of church planting and just fill them in and say, hey, um, I don't know if we're going to make it. And we said, okay, well, let's see where God works for the next year, and we'll see. But that summer was one of those times for me where I had expectations of God, and he didn't fulfill them, and I had to wrestle through it. I felt pretty called that Steph and I were to plant the church, and that was the mission that God wanted us to have. But I had this expectation that things would just go easy, you know? People would just blow up, uh, show up out of the woodwork. And, you know, not that we didn't have to do the hard work. We did. But I didn't expect that half the people would leave because of the economy or because they would move on from jobs or other reasons and that we'd be faced with closing it. I had in the back of my mind a warning that somebody gave me before I went into church planning. I know they were trying to be helpful, but it was you know, if you don't do very good at this church planning thing, you aren't going to probably get another call. I'm looking that maybe we're going to have to shut down the church. Housing markets de- declined, and I'm probably going to lose another $15,000 on my house I just bought a year and a half, two years ago. Well, where is God in all of this? Now, we have two ways we can deal with those questions. We can let them perk and say, nah, they're not really there. I'm fine everything's good, or we can be honest. John gives us the model of honesty. He sends his disciples and brings those questions to Jesus, and those are questions I raised to the Lord. Now, I brought them in prayer. I bought them, I was looking through scripture. I went and talked to wise counsel of people and asked them. I found a book called When God Doesn't Answer Your Prayer by Jerry Sitzer that quite frankly knocked me down a couple of notches and reminded me that sometimes God doesn't even give me what I want because I, 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 I'm not ready for it. My character isn't in a spot where, where that's the case. And he may be protecting me and I may not even realize it. I, I don't have an answer exactly why things went that way. I, I never got that answer. But at the same time, I remember feeling the sense inside of me Are you going to trust me or not? Are you going to trust that that I can plant Crossway and that I can bring people, even though it may not be on your timing? Or even if I don't, are you going to trust that all this is not in vain? Are you going to trust that I can provide you that call that that person said you'll never get? 
that you'll get over the 15 grand and that I can use even the most difficult things of your life for my good. Isn't that what Romans says, that God can use all things? And it was that brief moment. It wasn't easy. It's not like it all faded away. But it was those kind of things that God used to get rid of my expectations. My expectation that things were going to get, that, that my ministry was going to be numerically successful. And that's what valued its worth. That I, my bank account, and whether it goes up or down is a sign of God's blessing. And it's stories like Job. It's stories like Paul that remind us that God doesn't always work that way. That often, sometimes, he calls us to work through really difficult circumstances and brings difficult circumstances into our lives. But it doesn't mean that his way still isn't right, and he still doesn't have a plan, and it isn't good. And so when we face these moments of doubt, we bring them to Jesus. We bring those questions to him. We wrestle with, what are those expectations that we have that might not be right? But the last thing that Jesus ends with here is a truth that we need to hang on to, and that is this, that God's truth will win the hearts of his children. Jesus ends it this way, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. And so here's the thing. Children of God, members of God's family can bring these questions. They can bring these doubts and submit in a way of submission to God, not in a kind of and it, we can still be, it's a tough balance. I'm just trying to find my words here. Because we can bring them in kind of a spirit of anger, but still of submission. And we can know that God can be patient with us. And he's going to answer those questions. But we got to do the hard work of digging in and maybe letting go of some of our expectations that aren't biblical. But in the whole process, we can sometimes have anxiety of what's this going to lead to and what we see here and what jesus wants to say is god's truth will win in the end in the hearts of his children but wisdom is proved right by all her children and so we can trust that if we have this posture of bringing our concerns to god Submitting to him and acknowledging that his way may be right, as difficult as it may be, being willing to let go of our expectations and truly wrestle with what the word of God says and let it challenge our hearts. God's truth will win. So today I want you to think about that. What are the doubts? What are those questions? And what's the posture that you're having with them? Are you trying to sweep them under the rug or are you bringing them to Jesus? Are you, you saying, Lord, I, I need help? One of the ways that we can bring them to Jesus is by talking to wise Christians, to look at Scripture, to pray, to, to read books, or, or, or just wrestle through these things. But ultimately, it, it also requires submission and trust that even though we don't understand God's way is right and it is true, And we need to be willing to give up sometimes those assumptions that we have about how God's going to work in our lives. But be assured this, that God's truth will win in the hearts, in our hearts, because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. You are listening to a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. You can learn more about our church online at crosswaychurchwa.com. We invite you to attend a worship service on Sundays at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway 